big on introduction, so we didn't help me with this. Uh, he's a native of Australia. He did his undergraduate and his PhD there. Uh, undergraduate was at the University of New South Wales, and PhD was at the uh, University of New England. Uh, since then, he came to the United States. He had a postdoc at the Smithsonian, and then from there to uh, Fairbanks uh, and uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Uh, he uh, teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in biology and nutrition of wildlife. Uh, his lab uh, is working on uh, ungulates like reindeer, caribou, moose, and musk and also working on waterfowl, ducks, and geese, and some other non-game species like porcupines and bats. Uh, his uh, talk, as you can see, will be what does the cost, uh, what does wildlife cost, and so please join me. Welcome. Okay, well, thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. All right. So it is a pleasure to be in Texas. Um, I've been, I've been here. I've been back to state, the state of about uh, five times in the last 20 years, and um, I think my first time was actually, I went to Uvalde, <laughs> so I went visited your um, one of your uh, other campuses, Extension Campus. Um, and I uh, visited with a guy that was actually working on deer, um, Don Spallinger, and uh, Don came up and um, joined us in Anchorage. And uh, actually, one of the projects I'm going to show you today actually has Don as a collaborator on it, uh, on moose. So there's a lot of uh, connections between Texas and Alaska, and a um, large part of it is because um, both these areas have lots of big game animals. and um, and spend a lot of time and effort, um, not only in terms of managing them, but also in thinking about them. Um, and they all appear as pretty large part of the identities of these states. Um, the question that I pose here for this talk is um, really came to me from somebody that uh, attended one of my talks in a physiology conference. And I'm sort of a physiologist. Um, there's a, you know what Red Green is? The, there's a character in Canada called Red Green, and he's a man of a certain age. And um, men of a certain age should learn not to talk at times, uh, because he tends to give a lot of advice. But there's something that Red Green talks about, and that is, um, it's called the man's prayer. And it's, uh, I'm a man, and I can change if I have to. And I'm a physiologist, and I've learned to change because I've had to. And so I've changed into doing physiology um, and to doing a lot more stuff in wildlife. And uh, I was at a physiology conference, and I gave this talk on caribou and how caribou were, you know, did all these really amazing things. And at the end of this sort of discussion, which I thought was, you know, earth shattering, um, somebody in the audience said, so what did caribou cost? I thought, well, you know, you can't sell wildlife. So, stopped me for a while, and then what I realized was he was asking, what's the per diem cost? He wanted to know what it cost for me to do the research on the animals. And I thought, hmm, okay. And so I fobbed him off with a question that was, well, you know, you work on rats and caribou are a thousand times heavier than rats, and I only pay four dollars a day, but you pay 40 cents. This is a good deal. But the truth was that he had a different set of values for the animal. And the value of an animal is related to its cost. And a lot of people ask the cost of something when they really mean, what's your value? And people's values for wildlife change dramatically. And one of the problems with this is that we all have different currencies that we're talking about. And so the currency that he was talking about was, what's the value of the animal as a research model? And that stumped me, but I recognized that was actually the focus of some of the conundrums we have for managing large game in landscapes where there are multiple uses for them. This caribou herd that's actually um, just below Dead Horse in Alaska, um, these guys are on, on their way back from the migratory range, lots of calves of the year here, and they're walking through the oil, fi oil field. And conflicts between caribou and oil have been going on for the last 30 years at least. Um, and we've been very, very fortunate because many of those conflicts have been um, overcome by the fact that these animals, this, this herd in particular, has actually been growing 
during the entire period of the development of that oil field, which is very fortunate. But we continuously get sort of issues where people get into conflict about what is the value of this animal. And in many cases, what they're talking about is how do you manage this land for the interests of this animal, as well as the costs or the interests that we have for other resources. You could do an economic basis for this and say this is the meat value for these animals, and I can get the average you know, size of this, these guys and get an equivalent meat cost for them, and that'd be fine. The problem is that that's not substitutable. Okay? The value of these animals for communities that hunt them um, far exceeds the equivalent cost of meat. It's not substitutable. People, these animals and their herds represent ecosystem drivers, which provide very, very large impacts on plant communities. They provide a very, very important social basis for folks that hunt them for sport as well as for subsistence. And then they also provide what is a very important aesthetic value because if you see a aggregation of these, these herds come to thousands and thousands of animals. We have 100,000 animals in the smaller herds um, on the North Slope, 60,000 roughly. And we're coming up to half a million in some of these herds. The aesthetic values of those are incredible. And so the commonality here is to sort of start to think about, OK, how do we use a value or a cost that is relatable amongst us? And land seems to be that. And so people can ask, can point to a piece of territory or an area and say, what does this area mean for these animals? So as a nutritionist, um, what I do is I work in currencies of energy and protein. I look at what's available in the landscape and what's usable to the animal. And the thing that I'm, I realized is that it's, I can actually look at the demands of that animal and then work out what that means in terms of individuals in the landscape. And so what I'm going to try and push to you here is that present you some different ways uh, we've looked at how to convert energy and nutrients per area into days of survival and production for animals. What does this landscape mean in terms of units of animals? This is not an earth-shattering discovery range management people have been doing for years. The difference is wildlife managers have not used it because the variation in their system is rather large. And in many cases, they didn't know enough about the actual performance of the animal. So we can do calculations like this by using really good numbers for beef cattle, but we'd be pretty far off. So we have to refine what we know about existing ways of modeling these systems, but build better parameters in the model. In other words, better information to actually do better predictions. Our expectations of this, though, are not going to be that I can calculate down to the, the very animal what's going to be on this landscape. What I really want to know is what are the relative values of different areas. And the areas I'm talking about are the difference between one side of the mountain range and another. I can have a little bit of an error here. Okay? This is a system that I can use, but it's really important for us to understand how we share this, the landscape. And using a common currency is maybe one way of doing that. I'll start with musk oxen because they're relatively easily. They stay in one place. And then I'll move to moose. And I won't do all moose, but what I'll do is one population of moose that do stay in one place and we have a particular management problem. And then I'll take you to caribou, which are very, very problematic because they live across the entire state. And their area is still something that is challenging to us and also their, their dynamic responses to that area. So first we'll go with musk oxen because this is a confined problem. It's a confined problem that really is based upon what is the minimum quality of their range in winter. Musk oxen are really great animals to look at in terms of performance over the long term because they all stand for photos. <laughs> they do really well. You threaten these guys and they all stand there and look at you. And generally, because they face the threat, you line yourself up, um, you can get horn structure, which gives you age and sex. And so you fly back to these herds, and you can, from year to year, because the mixed sex groups stay pretty similar, 
what you can see is age, age composition. And one of the things you find when you look at muskox herds is that these guys, more horns, hair between the horns, young of the year, and two-year-olds wink in and wink out. And what this says is recruitment's weird. So you get years that you get no recruitment. These guys, once you get past three, five, they're really, really robust. But the problem with these populations is this group. These guys wink in and wink out, and a large part of that is the narrowness of the winter range. And so you can think of them, actually, as animals that essentially live in a huge, a huge ice scape, and they eke out livings in some areas that provide them enough forage. Okay? They don't do a lot of digging. They don't excavate. They are very passive. They stand and wait things out. They treat predators in the same way. And so, essentially, these guys are really going to be restricted to areas where they can find enough winter forage. This is the, home ra the, um, the range maps for uh, muskox in Alaska. Uh, muskox were actually extirpated from Alaska and reintroduced in, serious, in series of um, events. There's a couple of reintroductions here. The original one is in the 1930s and it came out of actually Greenland. Um, so there's the, the triangles actually give you the spots that they were introduced into. And those introductions started, went from as early as 1940 all the way up to the 1970s. So different sort of points. The yellow circle gives you the area that we're most concerned about because these animals, although the range map shows you that they they are they were introduced in that range, and but the range is not is not continuous. In other words, they have actually just moved over. The population is about 3,000, and it's staying that way. And the original idea for introducing these things was that they would become a species that would provide food. They would be huntable. But we've not been able to harvest them very effectively, mostly because they seem to be very sensitive to it. And part of the problem is recruitment. So expectations here is what is actually causing these guys to wink out and not actually expand. They'll expand to a certain range and then stop. Okay? And it's not because it looks like it's density. So, one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of being able to project, okay, what is the quality of the, of the land here, is to have some sort of metric that allows us to understand how well the animal's for, performing. You are working at, in places that require shipping fuel before you can actually do the helicopter flights to actually go down and find them. So the cost of working these animals and assessing their, their, their performance is really, really very, very high. So you want to be very, very effective when you get there, and so you need some tools to, says, to say how, how well the animal is performing. But if you're going to handle them, it's going to take a lot of time and effort. So one of the methods that we discovered was that these guys stand around, and they relieve themselves, and that's useful and they're relieving themselves on ice, immediately preserved. So this is a yellow snow method. Essentially, what we do is we pick up after them. And so because they're in places where they're going to be for most of that winter, we can survey the wintering ground for them, do our counts for the animals, and then go in and pick up yellow snow and fresh fecals. And what that allows us to do is to get an idea of what's the composition of material coming out in that urine. We developed this method, which is really based upon stable isotopes of nitrogen in that urine. Stable isotopes are useful because the body has heavy isotopes of nitrogen compared to the diet. And so whatever they're peeing out tells you where they got the nitrogen from. If the urine has very heavy nitrogen in it, most of it came from the body. So the heavier the nitrogen in the urine, the more body protein loss. 
So that gives us an herd estimate of performance, and that's what this is. So as this number goes up, protein loss is increasing. So this is a series of herds that were monitored over a few years. And what we had was a relationship between protein loss here and the elevation of the wintering site. And essentially, this is snow depth. As you get into deeper and deeper snows in these wintering sites, they have more trouble excavating food. Okay. If you look at the diet, what you see is protein loss increases as the favored foods in that diet de decrease. And that's graminoids, sedges, okay, in this, in this system. Now, the environmental component of this is that this index basically tells us what is usable range. And what we find out is that the expanding range that we hope to get these animals into has great summer habitat, and they'll be able to fatten on it. But when it comes to winter, they have to have lots and lots of reserves, otherwise they're going to run out. Who runs out first? Yeah. That's it. So this is fine, and what you get is old girls and old boys that really are fine at the end of winter, but there are no calves left. So the calves kind of bottom out on us. And part of the reason we sort of pretty sure of that idea is that a young of the year calf for a musk oxen eats absolutely as much as its mother. So a 100 kilo calf is eating as much as a 200 kilogram female. So they're twice as expensive. By the end of the winter, they're running out. So what this says is that, yes, there's high quality range. And what we really should be preserving are actually coastal sites. We need to make, conserve our efforts on making sure that populations are robust in the very, very heavily windblown areas that are on the coast, the places that we find hardest to live in, but they find a snap. Because high wind strengths take off the snow and provide them with better access to sedges. Those areas are also, generally, if there's a good window, a pretty good place for generation of forages. And so those are the best sources of land for those animals. The internal sites are areas that are basically expansion range, but are unlikely to be areas that are going to be established for long term. Okay? So conservation efforts or management of the species really needs to focus on those coasts. So as we start to look at these maps, people are starting to rec recognize that, yep, the ranges are coming in. But if we don't have much of a range or a population on these coastal areas, this population may actually be more vulnerable than we thought. Okay. Now, oops. The other animal that we wanted to talk about were moose. Moose are actually expanding their range rather dramatically in Alaska. And part of the reason is they're herbivores that specialize in browse. And what's happening in the Arctic is we're warming. And what's happening with the warming Arctic is that we're getting more shrub in areas of tundra. And shrub expansion is occurring. And now we have actually moose that used to be forest animals actually occurring well over the North Slope. And they're in areas that are along drainages that are really quite um, different to them. In an evolutionary record, moose were there before. But that was when the world was shrubby. So they are entering into areas that actually were historically moose habitat, but not in the same sort of condition that it is now. The place that moose are very important are actually in the southeast and the south part of the states, um, because moose are very large. And also, they account for a rel relatively large part of the subsistence harvest for people. So they're a very important uh, commodity in terms of filling freezers. Um, the problem with moose is that anywhere near urban areas, they do this. They walk across roads. And so there's a high conflict within urban development. And the other conflicts that we have with them is that they are also, in some of these areas, quite attractive to predators. And when you put roads and predators and people all in the same place, you have an exciting life. So that's what Anchorage is. This is the Anchorage area. And Anchorage is a developed bowl. And it's flagged, really, by a mountain here, the Chugach Range, 
And then up here is a corridor that allows them allows a certain continuity, but basically it comes into the Alaska range, which includes Denali at the top. The main inlet to Anchorage is this Glen Highway. And so this is a, by Alaskan standards, a very busy road. Um, it's pretty busy for you guys too, but it's a eight lane. So it's four lanes in, four lanes out. It is the largest road in the, in the, um, in the state and it feeds Anchorage every day. On each side of it is military lands, and this is a very productive moose habitat. Okay? There is an urban moose hunt. We sometimes joke that you could take a bus and go hunting in, in Anchorage, which you can, actually. There's a bus route that goes over here, and people are taking animals on either side of this area. This supports a hunt of about 30 animals a year, at least. Okay, um, and most of these, this, this accounts for like 60% of the hunt in this entire area. It's very, very popular, it's very accessible for people. The military lands are important because they allow us a certain amount of control of this population to sort of work out what's going on. But one of the other issues here is that these are all streams that are going through. And these streams are all salmon streams. So the military lands have a really good population of bears. There are brown bears, black bears in this place, and there's uh, at least a couple of wolf packs. So we were called in to answer a question about what is the forage base for the production of this moose population. And it, was a, it was a nice question because we had a lot, a lot of control on it, but we also had a pretty abundant predator base, and one of the reasons the military wanted to know about this was that moose calves are preyed upon by wolves. And so the management issue with wolves also um, was superimposed upon basically where is the food and where are the moose going to go, okay? Now, the strategy we used here was a modeling strategy. And the general flow of this diagram is, I don't want you to look at the details really, but all at the top of that diagram is what do moose need? The top part of the, the, pro, of the model is a nutritional model which says how much does a reference moose need? And we did this by looking at literature values and also doing a little bit of our own work to find out what does a reproductive female require in terms of daily energy needs and daily protein needs. The hard part is doing all this. The middle part was establishing what the food base was. And we took hundreds and hundreds of samples here, about 1,000 samples actually, for looking at food quality, but also the biomass distribution across the area. The reason we went through all this effort is that there's large variation in quality and quantity of foods for moose as we go across the Alaskan landscape. And so we needed to have local knowledge of this. Our model looks at moose in different seasons, so we looked at what was the cost of an animal through each time period, and we did the same measurements of food in those time periods. And we did it on different habitats. The question here was, what area is most important for moose? What areas should we be managing to conserve the productivity of this population, but also to limit the amount of conflicts, okay? So what we get at the end of the model is really pretty simple division of requirements per day and food available, how many are you going to support? So the bottom end of this model is total animal units for region. And if you do range management, this is simpler than what you do, okay? It's a really simple approach, but it's unique to us because all of this effort hadn't been done and working that out was a little bit difficult too. So what we find is that, not really surprising, shrublands are the most important thing. So on the x-axis here I have the different habitats and if you draw your line, eye to this big bar, it's shrubs. Okay? And the two, the y-axis has number of animal units in moose days per hectare. That means 
how many days can a reproductive moose support themselves on this area? Or how many reproductive moose can you support on a d for a day, okay? And as it goes up, it means you've got better values for the habitat, okay? And what this shows you is we had to break the axis to actually fit in the shrublands. Shrublands have 18 times the value of the dominant area of, these, of this landscape. Mixed forests account for about 80% of the land area, but 80% of the food's in there. And what that means is that you know what's important, and you can actually manage for this. The two currencies that I'm using here actually swap over during the different seasons. In summer, it's energy that's limiting. That white bar is lower than the, the crosshatched bar. And what that means is total energy supplies limit productivity in the summer. Okay? That means just biomass drives this. Lots of leaves. In winter, it's actually nitrogen that's limiting. And what that means is protein availability is limiting. That becomes important because winter is the narrowest time of year. And so this standing population that gets pregnant is going to be limited by this. So actually, this is the narrow point that you have to work for. And what we're looking at here is how much plant defenses we've got on the browse. You don't have leaves here, what you've got is twigs. How defended are the twigs are at the end of the winter? Okay? So what we're looking at here then is focusing on managing particular species of willows that are particularly important for this population. Okay? So again, you can customize a little bit more. So what we developed at the end of this, this project was this map turned into a series of hotspots. And the hotspots that we looked at were really a whole set of them were right across all the roads. And it showed that, yes, what we've been doing is creating really good habitat for these guys that end up then walking into the road of our cars. Okay? So, yes, we knew that we were ending up doing a lot of conflicts here. But the main productivity for this population is actually in this east range here, right up against the, 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 the uh, mountain range. This is the moose factory for this area, and managing this area area is probably the most important. Here, what we have is looking at conflict management and looking at how we essentially manage willow stands in urban areas. And what we probably need to do is that if this population is important to us, then we're going to have to figure out how to stay out of their way. Or if it's not, then what we need to do is to foster non-food value or low food value plants in this area to minimize conflict. Productivity will stay on this side of the road, but on the other side of the road, it's going to be flawed with all sorts of problems. One of the big issues here is that stream where the bears come down are right in here. And so what we probably need to do is to get really high quality willow habitat out of here because when moose cows are calving in this area, that's when we get into real problems which puts in kills right next to trails, next to people. So managing conflict and food may actually be the easiest thing here. What we have found out in the long term, though, is that there's very, very individualized movements of moose in these particular habitats. Moose are very, very um, particular about where they live because in many cases what they're doing is very carefully avoiding predators as well as cars, even though we do bump into them, we're bumping into naive animals. The animals that stay in these areas really know what they're doing. And we realize that because they're genetically distinct across this highway. So even though that highway has been up for 20 years, we actually have got a genetic separation between the populations. So there's structure here. But we're not at a stage where you know, people are really worried about the uniqueness of this population. But what we know is that moose move very, very, very um, differently from what we expected. Okay, so I'll give you the easy stuff. The hard stuff is actually caribou. And it's hard because they're all over the place. So the two approaches that we just used were evaluate animals on a landscape and look at 
so I'm get a better informed markers of performance in local areas. The limiting things for doing a model for these animals is getting good ideas of what they require. But the really big problem that we're faced with is this huge diversity of landscapes. Everywhere going, everywhere from boreal forest down here all the way to Arctic tundra. Now, the animals that are in these herds in the middle are actually very large bodied animals um, and they're very relatively small herds. You're looking at herds of thousands of thousand animals, or less than 10,000 in general, and these are these yellow bars, if you can see them. So 1,300, 650. These are small herds that are distinct because they have a high fidelity to carving grounds. Okay? Each one of these areas it distinguishes a particular carving ground. And so they have high fidelity to these areas, and we manage them in these units. Okay? The really, the, the bulk of animals that are a caribou in Alaska are actually here on the North Slope. And so at this census, um, we actually have the Western Arctic at 300,000 animals. So this green area is about 300,000 animals here, according to this census. It's, it peaked at 500,000. About 60, 70,000 in the middle one, another 60 to 70,000 here, and the one that moves over into Canada, the porcupine, is 170. Okay? The problem is that those numbers don't stay still. And in the terms of the Western Arctic, for example, this was, in the 1970s, 5,000. And it's gone to 500 at 30 years later, okay? So you have huge variations in the herd. And we know that's not because of fusion, because they have high fidelity to their calving grounds. And we've now been putting collars on them. We know, yep, that's them. They're going back. So we don't understand why we get this huge variation in abundance on this landscape. So the big question for us is why do these big arctic herds change so much? Okay? It's not predators because predator density is very low. It is predators contributing to this here. There's high predator densities in the middle. And these small herds are regulated by predation as well as food. Predator densities are very low on the north. And there we're looking at regulation probably by weather and environment, weather and uh, food. Okay? So that's the question that we're really um, trying to address. And so to start that off, because we really couldn't just run out there and model them like beef cattle, um, what we first needed to do was to get better parameters to inform us on how to actually model this thing. How do we predict this? Okay? So the first step in a recipe for moose is to acquire your moose. The first step in a recipe for getting nutrient requirements for caribou is to find your caribou. So we started this out actually as a collaboration or as a funded project with the forestry um, group. Uh, this National Council for Air and Stream Improvement. What they wanted to know was nutrient requirements of caribou for the boreal landscapes because they have to manage forestry across Canada. Okay? And caribou in small herds is a biodiversity issue in Canada. It's a major problem for them. For us, the total abundance of caribou on the Arctic Slope is much more of an issue because that's where we have development for oil, gas, minerals, and we have lots of communities that need to use those animals. So you have multiple uses. Okay? So the first step is to catch a caribou so that we could do some of the experiments. There's some little guys hanging around. Caribou cows disperse, or they aggregate for calving, but they find little maternity areas. And for a very short period of time, you have the opportunity to actually catch them. You have to catch them in the first 24 hours, unless you're an Olympic athlete. And I didn't have many, because you have to chase these things. They can run in about two hours. So you catch them in the first day, because they're going to be acceptable, and you get them, they look like this. Um, they're very, very cute, and 
they're very demanding. And so the first thing you have to do to get good subject animals, and this harkens back to the opening of this lecture, what does a caribou cost? It costs an enormous amount because if you actually have to feed these things, you are working 300 hours a week. Um, the reason is, is that they have a very, very high fat diet. So that milk is very, very high in energy. And in fact, if you take, if you get a milk sample, you shake it, you get instant butter. It's 50% fat. <laughs> so it's an incredibly nutrient dense um, material. These guys are small. They've got to eat a lot to grow very quickly. So to eat 10% of their body weight per day, they still have to, to suckle about 20 times. So with hand rearing, we can get them down to 10. Okay, we can get away with about 10 a day. But um, to get enough animals to do this project, we actually had to catch 30. We ended up bottle raising 27. That took 300 work hours per week. Put, and I had a crew of uh, half a dozen people, eight people to do it. Um, the other problem with this is that you can't hand off the bottles. They are, because caribou invest so much in their offspring, they are very, very insistent on who's mom. They don't cross foster. No sharing. Because mom does not have enough assets to share it around. And so cows will actually kill calves that are not theirs. So a calf is very careful about not wandering around and trying to suckle from others. So if you put in people, they immediately are specific to people. So they entrain on who's mum in terms of who gives the bottle. And so once we were locked into these guys, we couldn't actually switch out that team. So we had to just take them all the way through. Um, this is a lot different from whitetails. <laughs> so other cervids, they'll transfer, it's fine. These guys are enormously difficult to raise. So the hint is that the last time somebody did this was like 30 years before. Um, so <laughs> I understood. <laughs> they do grow very fast. You get off the system uh, enough, and you can finally start getting the work. In the intervening time period, we actually did several projects on these guys to get different ideas of the cost of uh, caribou on the landscape and how caribou could deal with things like toxins in their forage, how they could deal with things like uncertain food resources. The bulk of what I want to show you today is actually how we parameterize the model that we've, we're starting to develop now. So this is how we get information on what caribou do on a landscape. And we went through all this effort really to get trained caribou that would allow us to look at their responses while they were lactating. Okay, so we had to get them to reproduce and we had to get those calves to stay with them so we could do repeated measurements on them. Okay, so the investment is quite enormous. Um, so the end of this is what we did was we had 20 cows. They're all the same age. They're all wild animals, but trained into captivity. Um, we took them through the first pregnancy and the results of this experiment are really for those 16, um, 14 cows that are pregnant as well and, and lactating as, as well as animals that are then not. The goal of this experiment is to get responses of animals to simulated range conditions. And the range conditions we're trying to simulate are differences in the quality of foods. And the three groups of foods that are out there on the landscape are graminoid sedges, forbs that are really only available for a very short period of time in the beginning of spring, and then willow browse. Okay? And if you just compare the top two, what you can see, there's a huge range. And it goes all the way. The lower numbers are the winter dormant forms. And the upper numbers are the green up, the earliest, highest quality. And what we wanted to do was formulate simulations that allowed us to hit the middle of these curves. Okay? And so this formulation is a low energy formulation that really mimics middle quality sedges. Okay? the middle of the range that they're going to use, and it comes out at about 7% protein and about 60% digestible. Okay? Compared with humans, this is eh, terrible. Um, 
compared with range cattle, this is on the good end for beef cattle. Okay? For production, you want beef cattle up down here, closer in there. Fattening, you'll need there. Okay? So we formulated a diet that had as a base low energy and protein content. And then what we did was in the summer, we kept one set on this low quality diet all the way. And then we put two groups, one on to low energy but higher protein. So they had better access to things like Forbes. And then another group on essentially what was a good quality diet of willows at about 13% protein and high digestibility. We're what we're doing is simulating conditions where animals are migrating to ranges that have different qualities of food available. Okay. You cannot get enough food to grow in this, so yes, you're going to have to do a formulated ration. And so the other thing we train these guys to do is to deal with feeding gates, but if you separate them, they don't eat. They, they are herd animals, they aggregate. If you put them in individual pens, even though they're neighboring pens, they do not eat very well. And so there's many ways of getting very bad data for your model. Okay? So trained animals trained into these, these things will, these guys are all wearing little necklaces and they have a little uh, device, a collar, which is an individual collar and they have an individual ID to their gates. And so what we're able to do is get them always to an entire year on food intakes and the proof of this was this. They're so happy with this. The calves were happy. The calves, calves kept suckling even while they were working the system. Okay? So we got really good quality data out of this, but it took three years to get it. Okay? Um, this system is actually out of Minnesota. It's uh, used for dairy cattle and also dairy goats. Um, we modified it for these guys and for people in, actually not Minnesota, it's Vermont. People in Vermont were so pr proud of it because it could work at low temperatures. It failed in ours, but um, it failed at minus 20 for this. So we got them all the way from February to um, October. Um, but it worked really well. Okay, so this is the experiment. We have animals that are on a low quality diet in winter, the sedges. Um, they give birth to their calves, and then in summer, we split them up into different quality ranges or simulations. Measure their responses, we keep the calves on the same food as their mothers because that's what they'll have in the field. Um, and also measured their responses. At the end of the experiment, because we wanted to confirm that this was an effect of diet or food quality, we took all the animals and put them onto the high quality ration to see if we reversed any of the problems. Okay? And the answer is yes, it did work. Um, we also did that for the cows. We bred them and we had to see whether they um, would actually get pregnant again. But most importantly, we want to know whether they would re return their body conditions. OK, quickly, this is what we do with the calves. Um, on the bottom here, we have date. But here is day one is January 1. And so here is May 1. And animals are giving birth at the end of, uh, oh, sorry, this is June 1. Um, they're giving birth in midway. OK? And then we're weaning them in the fall here, and for us, the fall is um, September 15. Okay? So what we see with the calves is that the different colored dots tell you that they grow differently. Okay? The green dots grow fastest. So calves respond to not only the quality of their mother's provisioning, but as they move over to these diets, of different quality, they'll grow differently. Not surprising. Early on, though, it's actually related to maternal mass. The quality of mother's milk and the size of the mother transcends all the treatments. Okay? So it's maternal investment here for the first four weeks. After they start to transition and after mom starts to pull the milk and she's starting to reduce suckling rates, they have to go on to solid foods. And what we find is that animals that are on these green diet, green diet, the highest quality, they actually take off faster than the others. And so what we get is fastest growth rates on the highest quality diets 
And what we get at the end is when we switch them back over, we get compensatory growth. They actually catch up again. And particularly the males will catch up very, very quickly. And what they do is they eat a lot. So they can compensate. And what that tells us is that caribou are really quite flexible. And that problems that occur on the carving grounds can actually be overcome on migratory ranges. As they migrate off those carving grounds, if those ranges are good quality, they can actually compensate. And we see this in Quebec and places like that where they have relatively high densities of animals on some carving grounds. We see compensatory growth in those areas and winter growth actually occurs in some of those populations. So management or understanding range, migratory range, and particularly wintering range, may actually be very important for recruitment of these animals. Okay? Now, the mothers, the same types of curves look like, uh, the same body mass data looks like this. January 1's here, December, Christmas is over here, this is September 15th, this is birth, May. Okay? Body mass of the non-reproductive females, these girls are not pregnant, Notice that it falls. Non-reproductive females are lighter than reproductive females. Okay? The girls that got pregnant are in really good shape. They have more fat, more protein. These non-reproductive girls are still quite viable, and some of them bred actually the next year. But they maintain a lower mass. And remember, they're getting ad-lib food. They still reduce their food intakes. Okay? We've got a bunch of minus 40 degrees over here as well, but they're still coming, they're coming down. And they continue, even when these girls give birth and they've got abundant food, they still continue to lose mass. There's a set point until June, and then they switch. And what happens here is the solstice. Once we get back into the next light cycle, they all switch on again and they start eating, but they also program again, okay? The difference is between these groups is going to be lactation, okay? Now, for the reproductive females, they actually gain fat and protein at the end of pregnancy. So they actually do not increase intake very much. Uh, they maintain low intakes, but they start reallocating and they're actually starting to build protein while they lose fat. That doesn't happen in production animals. Production animals gain fat and protein at the same time. These guys can actually disconnect energy and protein and they can regulate lean mass independently of energy. That means that they're doing lots of really interesting things to trade off uncertainty in their environment. So, Bad things happen, and they're actually still able to channel energy in one direction and maintain protein in the other, okay? So they lose, but they don't lose as much, and they build at the end. Then they give birth, and, no, and neither group actually starts regraining until June, until the sol solstice. Clear diet effect, highest quality food results in very, very quick fattening. Okay? So, response is very, very um, closely tied to diet quality, but it's not really tied to intake. All these groups are actually ingesting at the same rate. So, the diet quality or range quality is really important in terms of their performance. Okay? Just like the carbs, compensatory gain at the end. Okay. Here's the audience participation part. Which of these animals, A or B, is on the low quality diet? B. You can be a nutritionist. There you go. So, most people don't. I introduced this because to convince you that I really did take them down to a really bad condition. Uh, I showed this to somebody, um, a colleague of mine, and uh, he said he wouldn't shoot that animal. It wasn't worth it. Um, it's really. You can see ribs, you can see hip bones, um, pot belly. It's eating as fast as it can go, okay? 
I'll show you that she recovered very well. But you can take them down to this sort of condition and they'll bounce right back. So the plasticity is really quite profound. And what that means is that all is not lost. Okay? What this demonstrates is that, yes, you can have range degenerate on these guys, but they always have the ability, or they, they retain the ability for quite a long period to actually bounce back. And from a management point of view, that's really important. It gives you a safety margin. Okay? So, animals on, what I showed you in the previous slide really is that this browse ration, the quality of the diet, dictates fat gain. Okay? Fat gain follows digestible energy. Digestible energy intakes are driven by the energy content of those diets. Similarly, because protein is disconnected, protein gain follows protein content. Okay? So actually, doing range compositions of qualities is actually quite useful for these guys because they're eating flat out. Okay? What we can do is we actually saw real measurable things on protein status in these guys. Things like antler genesis was different and low quality diets resulted in smaller antlers. It also resulted in later um, molts. What that means was they were committing less protein to other things. Okay? So they were really worse load up. Um, protein conservation is quite different in the low quality group. This group actually did gain protein on this low quality stuff, but it did some very interesting metabolic things to actually channel the protein to ensure more deposition than waste. Okay? So they did interesting physiological things with it. And they also did interesting physiological things with where they got the protein from to pay for the milk. Milk protein, this N15 signature, told us that it was derived from the body. But the carbon components, where they made the fat from, came from the body and the diet. So they were playing games with the currencies. The currency for protein, because it's always limiting in their environment, always comes from body. They ensure protein supplies from the, for the calves from their body stores, but they play little games with where the carbon comes from. And that means that biomass can still be used for milk production if they have body protein reserves to back it up. Okay? This is the aftershock. Okay? So you give them good quality diets, and within six weeks, they look like that. They finish molt, and look at the frame of the animal. Lots of fat on the ribs, lots of fat in the back, um, good for com completed. Okay? Um, this animal, and the few that we have, um, they did actually were capable of breeding, but they didn't. Um, so they didn't get pregnant, but some did. So this is the before and after shot. And it tells you that, yep, yeah, they can actually catch up pretty well. OK, total intake, what I told you was that they're eating about the same amount regardless of the food. And that's what this says. When they're on the same diet through um, reproduction, uh, through pregnancy, non-reproductors and reproductors eat about the same amount. They regulate body mass in very different ways, but food intake's actually the same. They just do different things with it. Um, here, the gain in intakes are really accompanying fat gains and body protein gains. The things that we were interested in here is what controls food intake. And what we realized was that it is actually sensitive to temperature. High temperatures suppress food intake in caribou. They're living in the Arctic. What the hell does that have to do with it? They're in a cold place. Why should food intake be suppressed by temperature? Well, part of the reason is that if you are eating very, very large amounts of food, what happens? In, during, the, during the meal, you start sweating a bit. You generate heat when you eat, and they produce quite a lot of heat when they eat. And so you get this problem with fattening dairy cattle, you get this problem with fattening beef cattle. Not surprising, if you are wanting to fatten during a very short period of time, these guys do that. So they have very, very high intakes, but these high intakes can only be supported when it's cooler. 
in the Arctic, the other problem with this temperature gain is bugs. Insect harassment is a big part of their feeding, and so they also suppress intake when it gets hot because they're also getting exercised by avoiding bugs, biting flies. Okay? The other things we found here was that, yep, digestible energy concentrations increase it, and non-reproductive females, because of the cost of lactation, was not there. They didn't eat as much. Okay. From a comparative viewpoint, how costly are caribou? Well, this is the same intake curves, um, but simplified. 3% of body mass is normal for mammals. Okay? And so this is roughly where they lie in winter. Still pretty high for an winter animal. Look what happens during summer. They start to get as high as 7% of body mass. Okay? Production cattle at the last stages of fattening, when you put them on grain, we'll, you can try and get them there, but you're going to get in trouble because they'll get bloat. So production, these guys do things production animals can't, okay? Because the window of food availability is lower. They have to make profit over very short periods of time. So very high intakes give them flexibility to offset problems with the range. Very high intakes give them possibilities of offsetting low qualities. The problem with this is it also offsets high demands. And so the model that we have for the energy requirements for these animals are here's digestible energy intake on this axis, here's body energy change. In the interest of time, I'll tell you basically this, that caribou, a normal animal would run somewhere around here for lactation. Caribou are running at five to six. They're exceptionally expensive. <laughs> we always thought that they weren't, but they're extremely expensive on the landscape. And what that means is that they use the range very intensively. And we didn't realize that. And that's part of the possibility that there's very high density feedbacks on these guys. So the populations do exhaust their food. And it's partly because they're much more expensive than we thought they were. Okay? And that's changing the way that we understand the regulation of these populations. Okay? I recognize we've gone a little over time, so I'm going to show you this. This is what we've done on the other set of that model. So I just showed you a lot about what we did to make the model and parameterize it. Now, this is what the food looks like on the landscape. Okay? To do that, we spent uh, three years and this is led by Dave Gustin at USGS, spent three years collecting forages across this range. The top of the range is Prudhoe Bay, the bottom of the range is actually the Brooks Range here, and this is about uh, 400 miles. Okay, so this is a 400 mile transect, and we've collected foods across that transect. This is the Central Arctic caribou herd and the quality of food on that range. And the three things, areas I want you to look at is this. They birth on the coastal plain, and then they make their way back through the foothills, and then they winter over here. Oil fields are up there. And we count them up here, because they aggregate. And we think that is the most important place for them, because that's where we count them. Where's the factory? That's where you deliver. Where's the factory? Here. Because the food intake patterns tell us that's where they gain. OK? So we've been managing here. And we've been relatively happy because the population has been growing. But what we didn't realize was the productive base is here. And so we're really concerned about things like, where do they migrate through? What's the migration corridors? Because the resilience of these populations is based upon not what they do at the carving ground, but what they do when they leave it. When they leave it, they restore their reserves for the next year. So the feed forward is really important here. And we've kind of focused here and not realized the entire herd is vulnerable here. That temporal and spatial thing is really important. 
here's how it looks when we actually track them through the landscape. And what I'm showing you is what they do as they move across the landscape. Here is a model of Julian Day here. And this is the cow-calf units that we project on the landscape. These curves are the food availabilities or the, the units that you can get at the coastal plain and the wintering range. And what I've done with these signs is just tracked the animal across the range because they're migrating. And what we find is that actually males are terribly lazy. They just stay where the high food is. But the females come into the coast and they join the males here. And this is where their intakes are highest. The caribou factory occurs here. Okay? And it's occurring between the lines. It's occurring in the, in the foothills. Okay? The number of units for energy is much higher than the number of units for protein. The population is limited by protein. We always thought fattening was the most important thing. It turns out lean mass gain may be the most critical. And so this is where you secure your calves. OK. So where we're going with this is that we're continuing with those sort of models. And what we're trying to do is essentially simulate different scenarios. We have enough data now to do quite a lot of good models. But what we're really interested in doing is how does land use and climate change affect the provision of foods for these animals? And how does that change their vulnerability? Okay. I started this by telling you what was that the cost would give us some idea of the value. And I hope you've sort of, un in, in a lot of detail here, I hope you've sort of taken away that what I really want to try and do is to get these animal units and these types of patterns of how animals use landscapes so that people can look at a map or they can look at an area and say, this is what that means for this animal. Okay. When you look at landscapes like this, and if you experience them, it's quite transformative because you immediately have some sort of ownership of it. And people feel very, very strongly about land and animals. But if you can give them something that they can commonly appreciate about what the land means for the animals, you have a better possibility of getting them to have an informed management. Thank you.